let's start with uh, Khalid Ali. Thank you for, for being here. Um, just a quick introduction. Khalid is responsible for running the International Betting Integrity Association. Since joining in 2008, he has driven the association to become a leader on betting integrity by building the membership to almost 100 betting brands and launching a number of research and education projects. Khalid has represented the regulated betting industry in a number of high-level policy forums, such as the Council of Europe's Convention on Match Fixing, the European Commission's Expert Group on Good Governance, and the Independent Review of Integrity in Tennis. Khalid, the floor is yours. Great. Well, let me just begin by uh, thanking Steve and his colleagues for uh, allowing us to be a, a partner in this project. I have to say, when this project was presented to us, um, it was one of the first projects that we looked at and we thought, you know what, this is something we could really contribute to. It's data driven and it just so happens that our members have a, a lot of data. So <laughs> um, we really felt this was a really good fit and it's great to see the, the conclusions of this report um, today. So just very briefly, because I know we only have five minutes, uh, I just want to explain who the IBIA is, what we do, and just uh, touch upon a couple of things that have been mentioned earlier today. Um, many of you probably have heard this before, and apologies if I'm repeating things, but for those who don't know us, um, the International Betting Integrity Association, it's a not-for-profit association, uh, which was created by the sports betting operators back in 2005. Uh, we were previously known as ESSA. Uh, in 2019, we rebranded because the world of betting changed quite dramatically because the US opened and we felt that we needed to, to better you know, change our name to represent who we are and what we do and actually where we want to be. Uh, we currently have 30 members globally. They represent about 50%, almost 50% of the uh, regulated uh, online betting market, so quite a substantial uh, amount. Uh, as I mentioned, we are, we are not-for-profit. Uh, the costs are covered by our members and the work that we do, we do not charge for. Uh, the main, uh, the main uh, operation of the association is the uh, monitoring and alert platform that we've created. And I'll go into a little bit more detail with that. But we also do other work. Uh, we just recently uh, released a report um, looking at what a sports betting, good sports betting model looks like. Um, and we also use quite a lot of our members' data for that particular project as well. Uh, and we've been involved in other Erasmus Plus projects in the past, and one of them was on uh, educating players. And we uh, ran that program for about 10 years, and we educated about 35,000 players, and, and we worked with Jeff and his colleagues uh, when we did this, uh, this particular project. This is our members. Um, they are all uh, licensed and regulated in multiple jurisdictions in Europe and now in North America. Um, also, when they become a member of the association, they have to go through a due diligence through us. Uh, that's actually quite a stringent uh, due diligence. We need to know who their, what their ownership structure is, where they're licensed, have they been involved, um, have they had any of their licenses revoked. If we're not satisfied with their answers, we do an enhanced due diligence, which is carried out by, by Dow Jones. And the reason that we have to do this is because, unfortunately, the betting market is quite large. Um, and I think it was touched upon uh, earlier this morning, you know, there's the well-regulated operators and then there's the not so well-regulated operators. And we need to make sure that the operators that are part of this association are extremely well-regulated. So the main, the main focus is really on our monitoring and alert platform. We have, as I said, you know, 30 betting operators who are sharing information uh, with each other through this platform that we've created on any suspicious betting. If they see anything, they will uh, raise an alert in the platform. That's reviewed by our team. Um, it's then reported if there's anything which we feel is suspicious enough or there's enough evidence there, we'll pass that information on to the relevant sport and regulatory body. In our code of conduct, there is a commitment that our members have to share that information with the sport and regulator. Um, this is also because of GDPR requirements. We don't hold customer information, but we do hold transactional data. And actually, in some cases, the transactional data is probably even more important than just the customer data. Um, we've reported almost a thousand alerts to various sports governing bodies um, over the last four years. Uh, as you'll see, tennis is the number one sport. Um, that, uh, that, that kind of comes up, and then that's followed by football. And then more recently, what we've seen is the emergence of table tennis and eSports. 
So these are some of the partners that we work with, some very familiar names that you've seen before. Uh, we've established a very good relationship with uh, all of these uh, governing bodies. Um, prior to COVID, um, we took our uh, members, our, the operators, to the headquarters of the IOC, where we sat down with them to discuss issues of betting integrity. Uh, in 2019, we were in the UEFA's head offices, I think Angela will recall, uh, where we were discussing with about 25 of our betting operators who came uh, what you know the Euros uh, in 2020 would look like. Unfortunately, of course, that got postponed. So we've established these relationships over the last uh, seven to eight years. And then, of course, we're also working with regulators and uh, law enforcement as well. So coming to the, uh, the friendly football matches, I mean, Steve touched upon this earlier. Um, you'll see from there, you know, there, ha there was an anomaly in 2020. Um, and this is partly too to do with COVID. You know, there was a sporting shutdown um, and there were a more friendly games organized in that period. And you'll see the top three countries in 2020 where we had issues, uh, Ukraine, Turkey, and Vietnam. Um, so I think we can also put this in perspective as well. I mean one in every 750 alerts that we've reported has come from a, uh, a friendly friendly match. Um, Steve talked about the first three points of in terms of what friendly uh, games mean to the uh, to the betting operators uh, and I just highlighted one, uh, one alert for every 750 friendly matches was offered uh, between 2017 and the last quarter uh, uh, of 2021 it should be. Um, I think the key thing here is, is that our members are well regulated. They are reporting anything that they see to the platform, which then if we find anything suspicious, we are reporting to the relevant uh, stakeholder. And again, to differentiate us between the unregulated operators, you know, there is a requirement to do this. There is no requirement on the unregulated operators to do this kind of stuff. Um, and that's really, that's an important message to take away. One of the things that we found um, during COVID was really about the, uh, the supply of data. And this is an area that has been touched upon in the report, um, but there's nothing really been done about it. There's no, really, there's no regulation on the supply of data. Um, and a couple of our members last year uh, got caught out by some of the data that was being supplied to them. And they said to us, look, is there something you guys can do about this? Can we put a process in place? And that's a process that we started uh, in, uh, in May 2020. Um, we sat down with a couple of the, uh, the data operators to see you know, what kind of standards we could create. Um, and so this is what we have now developed as a, a data standards process. Stats Perform was the first data supplier to be part of that process. Uh, and they were given a, a, a kite mark, which uh, I think they've been using. Uh, and I think it's proved very useful from the conversations I've had with them. Um, and also very recently, Sport Radar also has uh, signed up to this process. Um, we actually had a, a, a meeting with Stats Perform and Sport Radar and an associate member of ours, IMG, just a few weeks ago uh, to start discussing what other areas we need to start looking into. And I have to say it was a very healthy conversation, very positive. Uh, one of the things that we will be doing is having quarterly meetings with the data providers and there are a number of policy objectives that we've put together that we will be looking at to see how we can work together concretely in, in tackling some of the problems that have been highlighted actually by Steve's report today. I think I'm going to leave it there. Um, of course, happy to take questions at the end of this. Thank you. To introduce Simon, um, Simon is the Betting and Performance Integrity Manager at Stats Perform. His teams are responsible for del delivering betting integrity services to rights holders and analyzing events on the field of play and matches of concern to support investigations. Simon has over 15 years experience of working with governing bodies, regulators and law enforcement on betting related investigations across sports, including horse racing, football, cricket and tennis. Simon, floor is yours. Thanks. Thanks very much. Hey, everyone. Um, so yeah, for those who, who, who aren't yet aware, Stats Perform is the leader in, in sports data and AI technology and we, we provide services to the betting industry, to media, to sporting federations and also to clubs. Um, some of those services include betting market monitoring, intelligence services and performance analysis, which is events on the field of play, usually in matches of concern. 
Um, so we work with quite a large number of stakeholders, including La Liga, the English FA, the Scottish FA, and we monitor around 25,000 matches each year uh, for different rights holders. Um, so Cali's presentation focused very much on what the operators themselves are doing, um, looking at data on a transactional level. Uh, but we, we've spoken quite a lot today about um, betting market monitoring and overall betting patterns. So I, I want to spend a little time to talk about that. Uh, hopefully this works. So betting market monitoring, it uses data taken from global betting operators to analyze pre-match and in-play betting markets. So essentially the betting data taken from operators is combined with match data, which is goals, red cards, so we can track the progress of betting markets throughout the course of a match. So unusual activity is identified when the price we see that operators are sort of posting on their websites differs from what we'd expect, and we use that as triggers for, for investigation. And oftentimes, those discrepancies can be accounted for for legitimate reasons. Um, team news plays a part, usually in pre-match price movements. Motivational news, especially towards end of season, and even the weather plays its part. Friendly matches themselves um, are often, we often see unusual price movements, but the nature of the friendly matches is means it's very hard to analyze unless you take a lot of time, a lot of detail. We've seen matches where only, say, a team will field nine players in the second half, or they will switch for the youth team in the second half. So looking at betting markets alone doesn't tell you the full picture. You really need to see what's happening on the field of play. So after full analysis, if we still have concerns about betting on a match, we will then raise an alert to the, the sort of relevant authorities. So here's a sort of couple of visualizations of what this actually looks like in practice. Um, so there's two different matches here, match A and B. They're very similar in so far that they are nil-nil at half time and then end in three nil victories. Um, they show the over two and a half goals market of a football match. Um, so as you can see, match A kind of shows a pretty standard betting market where the price of over two and a half goals increases as time goes by in the match and no goal is scored. And then sort of you can see that green vertical line shows a goal being scored, then the market resets, the price resets, and then starts drifting again in line with expectations as time goes by. So match B is the same market, but a different game. And in this match, the price initially of two and a half goals initially starts to drift, but then it gets forced back through weight of money. So there's lots of people wanting to back over two and a half goals in this match so much so that at half time, the goal expectancy in the game is exactly the same as it was at the beginning of the games. So over two and a half is trading around 1.5. So that's despite only 45 minutes left in the game for those goals to be scored. And the kind of the cluster of data points at the bottom there shows our system sort of flagging this as anomalous. And this isn't very, this is one we would definitely raise externally. So that's kind of the, the mechanics of it. Um, just a couple of points and I'm running out of time. Um, we see that algorithm-based market monitoring takes you so far, but it, every match is unique and you need an analyst input. Uh, suspicious betting alerts, when we raise them externally, we do it to highlight potential issues for further analysis. We, we don't believe that the betting markets themselves are proof of match fixing. Um, and betting markets use Sorry, uh, betting alerts are not a silver bullet, so they can't sit in isolation. We think you need analysis and intelligence from as many different sources as possible, and you combine that as well with analysis of events, what's happened on the pitch, so then you can really get a, a detailed, thorough knowledge of the match and therefore the, the associated betting markets. So that's probably it for me. Um, thank you. Yeah, let's let's move to Angela B uh, um, to to have her presentation as well, and then uh, also of course to to Alexandra. Um, quick introduction again. Uh, Angela manages the intelligence program for UEFA's anti match match fixing unit, where she has worked to develop or expand a range of intelligence products to assist the prevention, detection, and investigation of match fixing, to include partnering on the investigation of initial susp suspicious betting alerts and driving 
an intelligence-led approach to UEFA's education and prevention efforts. Prior to joining UEFA, he worked in the intelligence community, both domestically and internationally on topics such as counterterrorism, transnational criminal networks, and cyber intelligence. Seems got like a good background to, to um, then move to, to football, Angela. So um, this is, uh, the floor is yours for your presentation. Perfect. So I just wanted to start by saying thank you for inviting me. Um, so both personally and then professionally on behalf of UEFA and the whole anti max fixing unit, it's a great opportunity to speak with you today. And I'm sorry I wasn't able to be here in person. So just a real quick word to start. Um, so the anti-match fixing unit at UEFA is strategically positioned within the integrity and regulatory division. So what that means is that anti-match fixing as well as anti-doping are grouped together, housed together with the integrity focused regulatory and disciplinary bodies or units responsible for developing those frameworks. At the same time, we're in a very different physical structure, which I think underscores our independence. Um, here, I wanted to add a, a small aside based on Steve's presentation, um, just noting that based on UEFA's current regulatory framework, we don't actually have, UEFA doesn't have jurisdictions on friendly matches. Um, I'm not joined today by any of my regulatory colleagues, but they would be the ones who'd be really best positioned to delve into that point a bit further. So our unit as it stands right now comprises five individuals. We've got Vincent who's the head of unit. He joined us as a sports lawyer, previously holding a similar role at FIFA. Then we have Massimiliano who's our lead investigator. Sarah, who is a policy expert and also heavily focused on education issues. Isabel, who's the unit coordinator. Um, and she's focused uh, quite a bit on our hat trick program, which many of you may be familiar with. And then me as the intelligence analyst. If you've been following recent news related to UEFA, you might have been tracking on the feasibility study, which was something that we launched in 2019. And in July of 2021, the results of that feasibility study were presented and accepted as an action plan on the same day as the final for the Euro. <clears throat> With that action plan, we've developed several new strategic initiatives. So those are focusing on <clears throat> strengthening our cooperation with stakeholders. So that's gonna be some exciting things down the road related to sort of workshops, training, and then partnering on investigations with sort of key international and local authorities, uh, building capacity, particularly amongst our UEFA member association integrity officers. And here, this will be in the form of additional training opportunities, material and other initiatives. Uh, leveraging or better leveraging some of the technological tools um, at our disposal to better sort of identify concerns related to suspicious matches, and then also to, to facilitate the analysis across um, the full spectrum here. And then finally, the resources. So all of this comes with a cost. So UEFA will be putting additional financial resources to the question or to fighting match fixing. And that will also translate into two new staff members for our unit. So I would say here, getting to sort of the heart of the presentation, uh, betting data and betting alerts are used uh, for four main uh, subject areas, I would say. So the first is um, as part of the, the risk assessment process. So we're conducting formal risk assessments. And in, in this piece, we're also aided by a lot of integrity entities and partners prior to both UEFA competitions and uh, domestic competitions. So for, to assist UEFA member associations. Um, the, those are done sort of prior to the competitions and then obviously sort of refined during the year and also taking into account leagues who have alternate season schedules. So on the one hand, we're looking more of sort of at the, the macro level of risk and indicators. So trying to see how, what sort of structural forces or structural elements um, might impact which competitions, which matches might be viewed as more attractive to would-be match fixers. And here we might look at something quite large, sort of the volume data and maybe compare Comparing that to our assessment of how popular a particular league might be and whether there is something anomalous in between the, the market turnover, so the volume being bet on that, and what we assess to be the interest level in that particular area. Is there any sort of geographic factors we want to take into account, as well as sort of the coverage? And, and here we're looking at um, obviously not every betting operator is offering 
every match and every competition. Um, and for example, do betting operators in Asia who might have larger staking limits and less robust know your customer requirements, are they more, uh, are they offering particular matches in a particular area or not? On the other side of this, we're looking at the historical betting data. And obviously um, the UEFA betting fraud detection system has been in effect for over 10 years now. So we have quite robust betting um, suspicious match holdings based on that information, as well as alerts that we receive from the variety of other partners, which has sort of continued to expand over the years. So here we might examine what has been happening historically involving a particular team or a particular country or a region in general. And from there sort of extrapolating what we might think the threat might be uh, moving forward. We'll also might put particular emphasis on recent alerts and other developments. So uh, moving on from there, and I think this ties in quite nicely to the, the question that was asked um, prior to me beginning to talk, is what happens when we get a betting fraud alert? And so here I will say that this is the first part of the whole investigation process. An alert based on betting fraud will come into our unit and then we will conduct sort of an initial sort of triage or review where we're looking at some of the, the team news factors we're discussing with other integrity entities other than the one who initially brought the suspicious match uh, alert to our attention. And based on that, we, we did make a determination whether there is sufficient or insufficient mitigating evidence to sort of bring it to uh, an initial investigation phase. And here I've just listed a few of the various factors that we're looking at, and this is, this is quite broad. And I think this sort of what was the assessment uh, 18 months or three years about what we're looking at for tennis. I mean, for us, it's a new way for perspective that that's about what we're looking at as well. And sometimes it can go even longer depending on the complexity of the case, the number of matches involved and the number of individuals involved. Um, here I listed just a few of the things that we do. So looking at open source, looking at the betting assessments, looking at particular historical factors, performance analysis is something that was also mentioned in one of the earlier presentations. And that's something that we're looking at um, Increasingly, obviously, player interviews, we talked about uh, cell phone data, so information that might be collected, um, and that is sort of quite dependent on jurisdiction as well. And then with law enforcement. So, and here I will note that law enforcement engagement, um, if we're actually sending information, obviously that would be done via the Fed poll or other appropriate channels, such as Interpol. Um, if at that point, um, we still think that the, the case is suspicious, that there are, are appropriate elements, then you have to appoint an ethics and disciplinary inspector who will conduct further investigation, which would likely um, comprise additional interviews. And then the sort of disciplinary assessment with our disciplinary colleagues. And from that point, we make the determination about whether or not there is sufficient evidence to move forward um, in a football disciplinary setting. <laughs> So here, um, as you can see, I think from the prior slide, betting fraud alerts really are that point of departure for investigation. Um, and here I've included a, a quote from Cass, um, and this is from the Skender Bell case, which I imagine most of you are quite familiar with. Um, what, what's important to us about this quote is what it does is it sort of validates the importance or the evidentiary value of betting based evidence, but notes that it cannot be the only evidence in a case. And I think this is both logical and, and really in keeping with um, our approach now. So here, we, we, we want to have that piece, we frequently have that piece, and then we need all of these additional elements to have a case that's actually robust and we can, uh, um, <clears throat> and can be upheld before CAS. And then finally, one additional use sort of this is in the, the broadly speaking, is trying to help in some cases determine who the potentially complicit party might be, who is the uh, participant on pitch or off pitch who might have um, manipulated a particular match. So here we might look at, at the market activity. And in that case, what I mean specifically is that certain participants might be in a better position to influence what we saw um, in, the, in the betting market. So for example, um, if uh, the card market was targeted, um, we might want to speak with the player who received this certain number of cards, or if there was a particular player 
that particular player. If it was about the number of red cards, perhaps we want to speak with the players or the referees, the officials who were involved there. Um, additionally, sort of uh, on the more granular level, once we can have, if we have account level data, that can also be a really valuable read. I think one of the earlier <clears throat> panelists was discussing the Ventspiel case, which was a recent successful case at UEFA. And in that case, uh, open source research uncovered close ties between one of the suspicious bettors, identified by a betting operator who was an IBIA member, and um, the president of the club in question. So that was obviously very powerful evidence uh, pointing to the club's uh, involvement in the manipulation of those matches. So that was a very sort of quick tour of um, the use of the betting data at UEFA. And obviously I'm available for any, any questions. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Enzo. It was very interesting to see how the process actually works because we normally only see the end product. Um, I want to follow on on a little bit on the complementary evidence and 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 also engage Alexandra here in the conversation and probably everyone because um, this is something um, which we've seen now the 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 integrity reports coming in. Um, perhaps also tracking individual players, be it by their individual performance or whether they have been involved in escalated matches, etc. Um, Alexandra, I don't have to introduce you, I think everybody knows you, uh, your reputation is, is, uh, is, is well known. Um, at FIFPRO we have definitely seen, um, I think in particular with the Igor Labut case versus the um, Football Association of Ireland, where national federations in football start sanctioning players on the basis of a of a of a bet of a on a, um, a sport of a, a sports data report together with video footage and that's the only two things can you give some some um clarifications or at least your 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 opinion on these kind of uh, investigations and, and sanctioning methods uh yeah exactly this is something that uh, we are very worried about because we we consider i mean as angela was now mentioning right um, and as it was mentioned before that it's not enough w with with this evidence especially to state that a certain player has contributed to the to fixing um a match and we deem that this this case of uh, Labuts was um, uh, a good one it's a it's a good piece of jurisprudence to follow and and it centers uh, on on this aspect right saying okay with the information we have right now even if we um if we can determine that the might that the match was indeed uh, fixed fixed because of of the report and and everything uh it was not enough to determine that this player indeed uh, was a uh, part of the of the fix and indeed like um if we look at the video footage for example of course they um prepare clips and then you see some uh bits of the game uh and uh, you need to of course look at the whole game to analyze uh, a, a certain match and, and the performance of a player. And you also have to understand that the player is a person, although we tend to treat them as robots. Uh, they are people and they can have a good day, they can have a bad day, they can be really focused or not, depending on their personal circumstances. Uh, and I mean, all of us who have played sports, even in, in an amateur level, we know that we can always make a mistake. And even if you look from it, uh, from the outside, and it, it can look very ridiculous, uh, if you're a goalkeeper and you didn't catch an easy ball or something like that, it does happen. So, um, yeah, we deem that this, this case was really important in this sense. Um, and, and it was also something interesting from the, from the, um, um, from the decision of CAS was that uh, reference was made to the fact that different experts presented by the appellant and the respondent were analyzing the behavior of the player in a different way. So they are all experts, but one of some of them deemed, okay, yes, maybe it's, it was not the smartest choice to make by this player who was the goalkeeper, whereas an, uh, other experts or so-called so -called experts would say, uh, it's impossible to take this decision if you're a professional player. So if the goalkeeper did this, then the, the, the match was probably fixed. 
So uh, here we see the, the complexity, let's say, of, of the situation. I fully agree, and, and, and uh, we see it uh, spreading now as well, uh, with uh, new cases in, uh, in Armenia, in, um, in Latvia, where also um, players are being sanctioned on the basis of um, just a report and, and, and video footage. Um, um, there's always a certain subjectivity in that if you if 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 someone from the outside starts looking at how a player uh, performed.